All right, so we're, uh, we're close to the end. So my job and uh, Millie Solomon's job, and Millie's going to find a microphone, I think. Millie's right here if the AV people can help her get mic'd up, um, is to per, kind of try to pull together the threads of what's been a very rich conversation today. Um, one of the themes that I think Nancy got us started on today was this question about how you frame it, how you frame the issue helps to find the solutions. And I think we've come back to that in a number of cases today. Um, and I think uh, Tony's work, I want to bring us back to Tony's work, um, is also about really how do you get uh, the people who are the real stakeholders to help do that framing. And I think we had some really interesting examples of that today. The, um, Lauren talked about the capable model and how there is a team that is, comes together to work with the, the resident to say what is the problem they're trying to solve. I wanted to take us back and thinking to, to Tony's framework, and I, and I was tasked with the surveys you all did to provide some sort of a summary of that. Um, Tony's definition of a just city is, to paraphrase a bit, that all people in communities, but especially the least included, have access to networks and environments with opportunities and resources for social and economic mobility. And in some sense, I think that's how she starts the framing, but then she turns to the community to say, what are your values and how do you want to get there? Um, I think it's an interesting exercise to take that, that expression or that, that definition of a just city and then think about it in the, in the context of aging. Um, you know, again, all people in communities, especially the least advantaged. I think Reese's comment at the end about the, the folks here having the conversation, how we define the problem, is a more advantaged audience. And so the, the others are, important group of people who aren't part of this conversation today, but I think the least advantage is clearly a key part of that. What do they have access to? I think we've been talking about having access to housing and to networks, networks that are social networks, to healthcare networks, um, and that are affordable, accessible, socially connected, connected to healthcare with the goal of avoiding hardship, uh, loneliness, um, and to have improved health outcomes. And so, but I think the, to, to turn to the, the survey results, um, the, and what did I do with them? Did I leave them on the table? Yes. <laughs> no. Oh, yeah, that's that them there. Yes, they are. No, they're not. <laughs> this is what happens when you have too many papers in your lap. Um, one second. Ah, here they are. Here they are. And so, um, in terms of the values, um, is, is Kyle Miller here? All the way up here. Do you have a microphone, Kyle? Uh, come down, make your way down here while I do this, because right uh, Kyle's a student who's worked with Tony. So they did the, did the tally, and the, the, the values that were most resident with this group, and again, I think what we have here is mostly a well-educated, mostly privileged, mostly white group. A number of us are suburbanites. Um, mobility was number one, followed by engagement, welfare. So, and that, you know, that makes sense in thinking about an elderly population, mobility, do you have the ability to get around, Are you, do you have engagement with your community, and welfare is your housing, affordable, and the like. Um, Kyle, just from your work with other places that uh, communities Tony's worked, what, what uh, mobility, engagement, welfare, how high are those? What, what's missing from those kind of top tier ones from your experience? Yeah, so typically uh, we actually did this process with Black and Design, a uh, conference that was held here about two weeks ago. Uh, and for that, we actually saw a number of people put power, which is something that we typically find within the top three, as well as resilience um, and acceptance. Yeah, so th those weren't really as high uh, for this population, uh, but surprisingly, mobility was, and that's not something that we typically see. Yeah, no, that, you know, I look at this, and power is number nine on the list. Um, uh, and uh, resilience is number six, and so you know, obviously, I think for a, a white suburban, well-educated, we probably feel in power, um, but uh, we're not. We're worried about these other things. So I think it's a very interesting to think about who's not in the room in that conversation. Back to the framing question: we're framing it one way, um, but other people might frame it a different way. And Absolutely. Thank you, Kyle. Um, just to summarize, too, some of the strategies that were highlighted. You know, and I think one of the things talking with Nancy about we had hoped to come out of this event was that people could take some things back to their communities where they went. So some of the things that came out of the, the comments in terms of strategies um, uh, focus on multi-generational housing, which came up a little bit, but I think is an, uh, an important approach to this. I was talking with Roger Herzog, who's here. Roger, in the break, mentioned to me, is it heretical to talk about the fact that uh, we have different generations and potentially you know, competition among generations for resources? Um, 
No, it's not heretical. I mean, I think, Nancy, in terms of the justice and equity and ethics of this is an important dimension of this. Um, and I think I would have liked to have, if we had more time to talk about multi-generational as a way to think about you know, solving this together and not just pitting in a world of, of, a, of, a, of a limited pie, as it were, or at least seemingly limited pie. A second one was make everywhere home, and so this notion that, that, that older people are welcome and uh, accessible to everywhere in the community. Um, accessibility, visibility, and housing, which we touched upon, transportation um, solutions, um, and then a senior advocate in government. So some interesting solutions there um, to, 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 uh, to think about. Uh, maybe we'll come back to some of this. I, uh, the other thing that my job is to do is not only just to kind of share some of that feedback from Tony's survey, but also to, uh, Millie and I are going to provide some kind of other overall reflections. Um, so Millie, I guess I'll turn to you. So what are some of the big takeaways you see coming out of today for yourself? Okay, thanks. I'm going to make a few comments, but I've also invited Chris to interrupt me so it can be more of a discussion. So please don't be too polite. <laughs> um, not a problem. <laughs> so. I would describe the four hours we spent together as a kind of journey, starting at a city that I would call bad news expected to get worse, and traveling along for several hours to another city called um, don't despair, help is on the way. So I wanted to, that, that sort of organizes some of the comments that I wanted to make, because yes, the first few sessions were news that are, is hard to take and, and has, it has a depressing sound to it. Jen told us that over a third of households are going to be um, households of people who are 65 years and older. And then we had painted through several, through several presentations um, really the overriding influence, I thought, my takeaway was of the, the Growing economic disparity in this country is, uh, is undergirding so much of the problem that we're having. Some of the problems are architectural. Some of the problems are redesign, for sure. But at core, I, the takeaway I had from all that data that was shown is that this is one more example of growing economic, um, of, in, of income dis disparities and the, the gap between growing wealth and l lack of growth for the middle and low and, and working class. You know, and just on that, I would say, you know, again, back to the framing point, that the conversation here migrates towards what we think of. And so we as you know, people in suburban communities or the like, and this question about do we have access to the, house we, the housing we need, we have the wherewithal, I mean, to, to back to Rodney's framing about the preferences, it's kind of do you have the, the, the affordability and the choice, and there's a, there's a problem in not having enough choice. There's a big problem in not being able to afford it, and that, that, I think that's an important issue that really hasn't come through as strongly today because of who's in the room. But. You know, I mean, Charlie Baker's quote I found that I think Robin put up, I found very uh, moving, because he basically made it very simple and humanly understandable. We want to allow people who have raised their children in these communities, paid for the tax base for schools, to remain in our community. So it was defined as a community, as a, as, as community building, not even aging by itself, but, but community building, and s spoken in words that I think most people can understand. So anyway, that was kind of, I, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to all the bad news that we heard in the, in the first two. I had one thing. I, you want to add? Yeah, yeah I, add, I had one more that if we really, we're not going to stay in the depressed town for too long. But yeah, we didn't really talk a lot about the caregiving, um, the, the lack of personal caregiving. So because we're at the Joint Center for Housing, of course, we were focusing more on other issues. But, but that's integrated, it seems to me, with, with uh, who are going to take? Who's going to take care of all these people? No, that's absolutely true. In fact, I, I realized I cut short the list. The last thing was more support for caregivers, um, and so it's absolutely an important part of this. Yeah. In terms of if we're thinking about aging in place, and that most people as express a desire to stay in their homes, want to stay in their homes. There's lots of ways why it's cost effective, but there's a lot of ways which that care is given by family members or given by very low paid workers, and we need to exactly. think about both the family members and the low paid workers because they're critically important. I then started thinking about Lauren Taylor's presentation, and she was basically trying to draw the connection between housing and health, and asked, what are the mechanisms? If, it does seem to be that, that, that housing's related to health, but by what mechanisms? And she offered four mechanisms. One of my takeaways from that is that this instability of housing is a big predictor of mental 
of mental health concerns. And she named a, a bunch of other takeaways that I think are worth remembering. But where I got most interested was at the end of her presentation where she was talking about how we are actually seeing healthcare systems try to address the housing problem. And she, um, I just want to underscore the cautionary note that she ended her presentation on and to say, let, think about that. And I'd love this, as, an, as a housing expert, I'd like your view on this. It seems to me that we live in a culture that wants to frame everything in medical terms. And if we can frame it as a medical problem, then we throw money at it. I mean, think about how well-funded the National Institutes of Health is compared to the Centers for Disease Control. We like to medicalize social problems. And as a housing expert, how does it feel that you know, we, we would be turning to the health system to, to fix something for which there are other disciplines who are very be better prepared? Well, I think that's a, I, mean, I think that goes back to what Nancy was describing about we, we define this as a, a medical problem and that's a medical solution. You know, I think as a houser, one of the reasons why we keep looking to the healthcare system is because it looks like there's a lot of money over there. <laughs> and so it's really kind of saying it's like, you know, we're over here, one in four families, one in three older adults get housing assistance, you know, can we just get a little bit of what you got over there? So I think there's a little bit of the system overall is not funding the kind of supports that we need and so we're trying to beggar the other parts of the system right. in a but way that doesn't make sense, as, as Lauren was pointing out, in the ways in which you create, you know, why would you have housing run through a healthcare system? You're going to pay for navigators rather than for houses. So, I mean, I think what's going to happen is it's going to enrich the health system because they're going to fund themselves to do a middle person kind of function and not, still not giving us the, basically we need housing, so. And we I need think we're in and, on that. And, and more secure, more income security for people who do have houses but want, and want to stay in them. Um, I, when I was thinking about how we love to medicalize social problems, um, it made me think about the fact that we haven't talked at all about the role that robots would play in these houses for people with aging. And um, Amy talked about a lot of really exciting things that are happening in Japan but not anything to do with the rise of robots as, care, as caregivers in Japan and around the world. Not just Japan, the EU has a major report calling for assistive robots to help the elderly in homes throughout members of the European Union. So um, it's a, you know, it may be very helpful. I mean, I'd personally like a reminder of when I leave the gas stove on, but I don't necessarily want my caregiving to, to change from human beings to robots in other, in other dimensions. So, um, that's an area that's kind of lurking out there, along with that caregiver list. Yes, you know, and I think Jen mentioned the idea that technology can be a way to address a lot of these issues in terms of connecting with people. Um, I don't know, maybe over in the break we can have a chance to catch up with Emmy about the robots in, in Japan. I'd be interested in her take on that. But yeah. Um, should we go to the city where it's don't despair? Help sure, us on yeah, the way? we only have two minutes left oh, okay. or so. So, um, All right. so, 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 so get us Do, out of despair. You, well, you mentioned some of the remedies when you, in your opening remarks. No, no, tell, take it. So, uh, no, you can do it. You've got a good list there. All right. Well, I think the first thing is that we already know what people want. We want aging in place. So that's a good, that's a good thing, that we know what we're aiming for. And we even know, it, to some extent, what is needed to do that. We just haven't figured out how. Where are the points of leverage? And I, I might take, you know, I think one of take my takeaways. Exception with that? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, Emmy's uh, point about the fact that we think we have a solution, but we need to talk to people to find out exactly what it is they need. We think what they need is one okay. thing. Yeah. And I think uh, Emily's point, too, about the, the process in age friendly communities, it was about the dialogue that surfaced. And, it, and not only did it surface different answers, but it also creates connections and the like. So I would hesitate okay. to say we know. I All know. right. That, yeah, I it's think, better to stay more humble. <laughs> It's better to stay more humble, but what I meant was that there's a sense that we need more houses and that there might be ways that we use regulation, the comment at the end of the last session, how can we help local planning and zoning committees at the local level deal with this? Questions like how could we incentivize the, pro I don't know if it's possible, but how can we deal with the fact that real estate development is meant to maximize profits <laughs> when those may not be what's going to help the, co the community stay together. So I think rem regulatory remedies, um, 
a gentleman from Cambridge mentioned at the end of the first session um, the, the role that even communities floating bonds might, and then I was thinking that that could happen in a way that would return investment to the community if it could be seen as communities investing in themselves through their own financial mechanisms, pri whether there are private public partnerships that are models. So uh, that's what I meant by, we don't necessarily know the how, but we know that one of the goals is to enable people to stay in their homes and, or to access new kinds of more appropriate housing as they, as they age. Um, uh, I, yeah. I, do, I do think there's a lot of a lot of it, uh, uh, valuable approaches, a lot of uh, information we've learned that we can we can uh, certainly pursue. And I think I, I think Emmy's comments about the fact that there's a lot more creativity out there and a lot more people have solutions to these things than we even can suppose is that there's there's a lot more that we can tap. There's, we and and as Emily said, it's about the process. It's design, learn, do, and so. Um, there's a lot, I think there's a lot to be uh, hopeful for, because there's gonna be a lot of older people, and we put them all to work and figure out how to do this. Yeah. So I have one final positive thing to say, which Let's is hear it. this is not a red-blue issue. This is an issue that everybody, no matter their politics, they might differ on hows, how to do it, based on political points of view, but all of us have family members who are aging or are anticipating our own um, aging, and it should be a topic that we can rally around. I'd agree with that. Um, I think it, with that is a good note to end on. This is not a red-blue issue. This is a, it's an issue that we're all, we can all share and can all uh, see the need to address. And I think we can also all agree that this is something that requires public involvement to address. Definitely. Um, I think the last thing I have to do is offer some thanks. And so I want to thank by uh, all the speakers and the panelists and the moderators we had today. I thought they really, uh, we, we got a wealth of information, a really rich discussion. I'm really appreciative of all you taking the time. Um, I have to thank Jen, Nancy, and Emily, who were the, 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 the brains behind putting this together, the, the energy and the drive to see that this come to fruition, certainly um, with the Hastings uh, uh, support. Um, and I guess uh, last and by no means least, uh, Kerry Donahue, James Chackness, um, and David Luberoff from the Joint Center who also do a, a tremendous amount to put on the logistics of the event. Thank all of you for your contributions to making today such a good event. So, um, and lastly, thank all of you for coming, for, for sticking with us through all this time. And as a reward for that, A, you get to, to take these learnings back to your communities and, and try to, to work on these things, and B, you get a beer or a glass of wine across <laughs> the hall in Stubbins. So please join us for a reception, and please join me in thanking all the people who were uh, with us here today.